Longtime listeners to the podcast know that I am obsessed with Mithras candles. They are the most beautiful beeswax candles I have ever seen, and they're handcrafted in Philadelphia. Mithras candles smell intoxicating, and they look even better with their wizardly dripped pillars. They also come in a variety of other shapes, from pyramids to tapers to tea lights, and they give off a warm and gentle glow. I have tons of Mithras candles, and I can't get enough. And now you can get some too by going to MithrasCandle.com and using offer code WITCH for 10% off your first order of 2019. So go to Mithras Candle, that's M as in magic, I-T-H-R-A-S, Candle.com, and use code WITCH for 10% off your first order of the year. The world is filled with bewitching people, and you might be one too. Welcome to the podcast where art is magic, magic is real, and reality is stranger than dreams. I'm Pam Grossman, and this is The Witch Wave. Welcome to the Witch Wave. It's early March, and this strange in-between season often makes me think of the song Funny Time of Year by Beth Gibbons and Rustin Mann. Even though it's supposed to be spring soon, it's still pretty cold, and here in New York, we're most likely going to get more snow, even though March is supposed to come in like a lion and out like a lamb, as we're taught in elementary school, but which rarely ever seems to actually happen. This is time when, at least for me, winter tends to drag on and on and on. Maybe that's just because I'm antsy for spring to arrive. I want to see green and budding flowers and colorful clothing, and instead it's just more and more gray. This past weekend, we set our clocks forward an hour, so at least there's a little more sunlight. But still, for me, that only somehow adds a little bit more tension between the winter and the spring. It feels like now is the time to be making plans and anticipating lots of upcoming activity, and yet my body still just wants to rest and stay shrouded and cocooned. I am not ready to wake up yet. Now, one of the things I personally battle is anxiety. And I know that there are a lot of you out there who would love to hear more about the relationship between magic and mental health. And I promise we're going to be exploring that topic in more depth down the road. But today's episode definitely speaks to it a bit, as so much of the work by my guest, the artist and writer Yumi Sakugawa, explores the ways in which meditation, magic, and creativity can help people live more healthy and meaningful lives. People often ask me how to start a witchcraft practice, and I usually tell them some combination of these three things. Try making an altar. Try paying more attention to the phases of the moon and the changes of the season. And meditate. I confess I often have an aspirational relationship to meditation. I go in and out of my own meditation practice, sometimes doing it for 20 minutes twice a day the way I was taught, sometimes doing it once a day, sometimes not doing it at all. And when I fall into those periods of not having done it for a while, I really feel it. I'm more anxious, more fuzzy, and less in sync with my life and the larger world. In my experience, meditation isn't quite relaxation, though that can be a really happy byproduct of it. 
Rather, it's an active attentiveness to the present moment and an awakening to nowness, so much so that your own ego or rigid sense of separateness from everything and everyone else begins to dissolve. It's a tool that anyone can learn or put to use at any time, anywhere. Sometimes I have the luxury of meditating on my couch or in a chair with a kitty cat curled up on my lap, but a lot of times I'm doing it when I'm on the subway or walking or washing the dishes. It's one of the ways I manage my anxiety, and it has truly helped me become a more effective witch and human being. It also reminds me that I have all the magic I need inside me right now. There's a short poem I came across by Lalashvari, the 14th century Kashmiri saint and mystic poet, as translated by Jane Hirschfeld. Lalashvari writes, I was passionate, filled with longing. I searched far and wide. But the day that the truthful one found me, I was at home. It's such a beguilingly simple sentiment. And to me, it evokes the end of The Wizard of Oz when Glinda tells Dorothy that she had the power to go back to Kansas the whole time. And Dorothy responds that if she ever goes looking for her heart's desire again, she won't look any further than her own backyard. I don't think this is meant to imply that we shouldn't go on adventures or be curious or seek knowledge, but it does remind us that we needn't always look for answers and certainly not for happiness from external sources, that if we are still and quiet and take the time to dwell within the home that is our own inner selves, we can find great truth and great treasure. My conversation with Yumi Sakugawa also reminded me of this as she uses meditation, writing, and illustration to quiet her own fuzzy-headedness and reconnect to higher states of being. But before we get to that, first, let's check and see what's come through on The Witch Wire. Who is it? Witches! Rachel writes... I have a question that might seem a little unusual and was hoping you could give me some direction. While I feel so happy to have found this path of spirituality, there's just one issue. I am terrified of ritual. I've managed to do some basic intention setting with candles, but find myself paralyzed to go any further. As someone who suffers from anxiety and depression, I'm concerned that I will somehow have a terrible, dark, or anxious thought as I complete my spell and bring about terrible consequences. I'm probably not the only one with this issue and would love to hear your thoughts on whether this is a real concern and how to overcome it. Thank you so much for the podcast and all you do. Hey, Rachel, I totally feel you. Anxiety and depression are no joke, and I know how at their worst, they can seem like they're taking over and infiltrating our very thoughts. Before I go on, I of course have to say that magic and meditation are no substitute for therapy, and in some cases, medication. So I hope you are getting more formal support in those areas if and when you need it. I myself see a therapist regularly, and I have during various periods of my life since I was a teenager, and I'm now in my 30s, so there is no shame in that if you're not doing so already. But as I stated earlier, meditation is a wonderful supplement to your magical practice and to your mental well-being. It really does help calm the mind and bring focus to both everyday living and ritual. And for me, at least, meditation has taught me that it's not about resisting the anxious thoughts or trying really hard to stop them. It's instead about learning how to detach from them when they show up, because those thoughts are not me. They are fleeting, 
and meditation helps me learn how to observe them like weather or passing clouds and not be so overwhelmed or carried away by them. Furthermore, spirit has a sense of humor sometimes, but from my perspective, is not cruel. It allows for imperfections and aberrations as long as your intention is clear and your heart is open. You don't have to think perfect thoughts and have perfect actions. Nobody does. You don't have to have exactly the right words all the time. Nobody does. There have been times I've called the directions of circle in the wrong order, or a candle has blown out, or I've misspoken, and nothing terrible came of it. So if your ritual is coming from a place of love and sincerity and hopefulness at its core, but then some terrible thought crosses your mind while you're doing it, it's okay. Spirit is not going to hold that against you because it connects to a higher frequency than just our thoughts or material actions. Think of your relationship with spirit as a relationship with a dear friend. It's an energy exchange. And this dear friend is forgiving and loving and gives you the benefit of the doubt. This friend never expects you to be perfect and just wants you to show up and hang out with it and be as open and appreciative of it as you can be. So just do your best, whatever that means in the moment, and I promise that's good enough. May your magic be perfectly imperfect, and may you treat yourself as a good friend too. Now, on to my guest, Yumi Sakugawa is an artist and author whose illustrated books and comics include There Is No Right Way to Meditate and Other Lessons, Your Illustrated Guide to Becoming One with the Universe, and her newest book, Fashion Forecasts. Her comics have appeared in many publications, such as The Believer, Bitch, The Best American Non-Required Reading 2014, and The Rumpus. She has also exhibited multimedia installations at the Japanese American National Museum and the Smithsonian Arts and Industries Building. On this episode, Yumi and I discuss how she came to combine her art and writing with her spiritual practice, the magic of meditation, and the importance of having tea with your demons. Yumi joined me from her home in L.A. via Skype. Yumi Sakugawa, welcome to the Witch Wave. Hi, Pam. Thank you so much for having me on this day of Venus. Oh, thank you so much for being here. Yes, it is a Friday afternoon when we're speaking, a day of love. And I think that's pretty perfect for us to have this conversation. I agree completely. Love has been on my mind a lot, actually. So I'm excited to talk about that, too. Ooh, I want to hear all about that. I almost want to start there. Why is love on your mind, Yumi? Well, I just felt like 2018 was such a hard and intense underworld journey for me. And I feel like in the very early parts of this year, I feel like I'm slowly emerging from the underground and I feel like the soil is churning and new new things are sprouting out from the ground. And I feel like last year was such an introspective, hermetic, reflective year. I'm kind of over that, Pam. I feel like 2019, <laughs> I'm like, you know, numerologically, it's the year of the empress. I just want sex and love. I really want pleasure embodiment, working with my root chakra, really being in my body. I feel like I've spent so much of my life being in that crown chakra, third eye chakra plane of like, oh, pulling in visions, meditating, sort of like being in that ethereal realm, which is certainly transformative for me, especially when I first started meditating. But now I feel like the pendulum had to swing the other way. So yes, I am so in the same boat with you. And I think A lot of people are going to relate to that because we have been through a lot of darkness collectively, politically, I think spiritually. Mm -hmm. And while we're talking about love, 
I want to talk to you about your artwork because I love your artwork so much and it really conjures feelings of love and open heartedness in my psyche and self. And it's always a little bit tricky to have an artist on the show because our listeners don't necessarily know what your work looks like. I'm sure many of them are big fans already, but for those of them who might not be, can you describe your visual style in your comic books and your illustrations? Sure. A lot of people point out to me that my drawing style is pretty simple. So a lot of the work that I'm known for, specifically my book, Your Illustrated Guide to Becoming One with the Universe, it's black and white line work with inky washes. And I I really like to incorporate a lot of emptiness and space into my artwork. So then there's these areas that are um, very detailed or very dense. I like to just do very simple line work. And I like it to be fun and playful and organic. I don't like to labor too intensively over my drawings. But overall, whether it's black and white or in color, I like to have this sort of loose, almost childish approach to drawing where I'm not taking it too seriously. So I like to have loose and playful energy in my work where I like fantastical characters, people that might have animal heads instead of human heads and just things sort of sprawling out very organically without overthinking it. Yeah, that's really what I love about your work is there is this, the word whimsy comes to mind, but I don't mean that to imply that it's not serious because so many of the topics of your work are about the universe and love and the cosmos and meditation and all of these big, big fields of exploration. And so I really love the juxtaposition of this more, I don't want to use the word childlike. I don't want to use the word innocent. (laughs) Um, But there's, there's like a joyfulness and a, you use the word loose. And I think that's a really great word. I would say that for those of you who say your drawings or your paintings are simple, I actually really disagree. I think of your work as really intricate and having these complicated designs and textures and line work, but it is also very free feeling, which is so attractive to me. Oh, that's so great to know. I think just because I have illustrator friends who are much more technically advanced and more patient than I am. I think I just have like really high standards for myself. But but that's really great to hear. Yeah, I mean, your style, it's certainly not photorealistic. It, it's definitely illustrative. But I just think it is so enchanting and beautiful and has so much depth to it. So just one witch's opinion, but letting you know. Now, a lot of your work also has touched on the fact that you came to meditation going through dark periods. I mean, we started this conversation talking about a dark period, but I know you had periods in your past that led you to using your art to explore your own spirituality. How did that all come to pass? It all started when I was just fresh out of college I graduated from art school at UCLA, not knowing what to do with my life. And so I decided to teach English abroad in Japan. And it was during that year that I hit a really, really, really low point in my mental health. I was diagnosed with depression in my freshman year of college, but it was during college where I also did have free therapy, medication, a support group of friends. And then going to Japan, all of a sudden, I had none of that. I went to this really, really dark depression. And it just so happened serendipitously that a colleague of mine who was really into yoga and meditation, I don't even know how the topic came up, but she lent me a copy of Eckhart Tolle's book, A New Earth, who also wrote The Power of Now, and he writes about his own spiritual awakening and getting into a mindset of embracing the present moment. The other work that serendipitously came into my life during that time was 
the film director David Lynch's book, Catching the Big Fish. Yes, that book had a huge impact on me too, for sure. And I appreciated that book so much because it's speaking about meditation from an artist's perspective, which I think just makes it a lot more relatable compared to sometimes, say, listening to a Buddhist monk or a Buddhist teacher Mm -hmm. (laughs) who's already uh, been trained and figured it out. Meditation made him so much more creatively intuitive and not just that, but just made him really happy. I think not so much inspired. I think it was just the only option I had. I just felt like, well, I'm miserable and I'm in a really dark place and I don't really have anything. So I'm just going to throw myself into this meditation thing and see what happens because people seem to be really into it. From there, I just listened to guided meditations. I think David Lynch says in his book, oh, I meditate 20 minutes every morning and every evening. So I was like, well, okay, if it works for David Lynch, I'm going to do that too. Yes. Yeah. (laughs) And he does specifically transcendental meditation or TM, which listeners might be familiar with, but there are certainly many, many different styles of meditation. Absolutely. And, And in my case, it was just 20 minutes of listening to silence and just sort of quieting my inner thoughts and being a witness to my own thoughts. And I think from there, over time, it was just really palpable, the difference between starting a day meditating and not starting a day meditating, where over time, it just became like brushing my teeth or taking a shower, I just can't start the day without meditating. And I think in meditating, you're just clearing the gunk from your psychic channels that connect you to the good stuff. And it makes you a more intuitive, open person. And I think you're just more receptive to things unfolding in this more intuitive, beautiful way instead of getting triggered by little or big stresses, allowing for things to flow through you rather than feeling like you have to control everything. I can't imagine being a creative person being a human being without my daily meditation practice. I'm really thankful that I happened to discover it over 10 years ago. And it continues to be something that informs me and my art practice to this day. Yes. And were you doing artwork in Japan while you were doing this meditation? When did you start combining your art with your meditative practice and with your other kind of uh, contemplations of the universe? I think very early on, just for my own personal private musings, I was beginning to make drawings about meditation and just how that affected me. It just so happened that after I graduated from college and I had that year working abroad in Japan, my first day job uh, randomly was uh, working for an internet startup founded by Deepak Chopra's daughter, Malika Chopra. So I was working for this blog website for self-help authors. And I think having been exposed to so many different self-help authors and the content that was out there and having this growing interest in meditation, I think I was just very surprised by how little visual works there were about meditation. And I saw this gap that was missing in the self-help conversation, having visual guides to make meditation, which which can be so abstract and intimidating if you've never meditated before, to be able to provide that through my work, which was also a really fun way for me to also continue engaging in my practice. And so just very casually, I just started posting the work online and it just sort of took on a life of its own where it became a self-published mini comic. The self-published mini comic zine started selling out at local independent bookstores that were carrying. And then it eventually became uh, the two meditation books that are now in hardcover form. Now your illustrated guide to becoming one with the universe and there is no right way to meditate. And these books are so precious. I mean, they are absolute treasures. I'll focus on your illustrated guide to becoming one with the universe because that's the book that made me fall in love with your work, though I love all of your books. But 
not only are you exploring meditation and exploring the meaning of life and transcendence, but you're giving little exercises and assignments to the reader in a very gentle and inviting way. It doesn't feel like homework, but you are really guiding us. You are teaching us. And I appreciate that because when I first started meditating, first I looked into TM and no disrespect to anybody who follows TM or goes down that path. But at least in my experience, I had gone to an initial meeting and then it turned out that if you wanted to learn, they were charging something like $1,500. And I was like, oh! and at the time, I mean, heck, even now, like that yeah. was not <laughs> that was not a comfortable amount for me to be spending. And interesting that you mentioned Deepak Chopra because I started Googling around and I was like, well, if TM is what a lot of creative people and folks that I admire are attracted to, I wonder if there's like a cheaper version. Yeah. Yeah. And Deepak Chopra has his own method called primordial sound meditation. And this I was able to find a workshop for here in New York. I think it was like a weekend and the whole weekend was maybe, I don't know, three or four hundred dollars. But again, still not cheap. But for me, it was worth it because I really, really wanted to learn and I really wanted there to be someone in person to teach me. It's just where I was at in my life. But even that is cost prohibitive to a lot of people. So to have your book be a great portal to meditation for people, I think is such a gift that you're giving because there are real practices that you're teaching us how to do. Well, hence why my third book is called There is No Right Way to Meditate. As an Aquarius rising, I just always sort of have that feeling of like, well, I don't like strict, serious dogma. Even if you don't formally meditate, for some people, jogging around the park is their meditation or walking is meditation or just sitting outside with a cup of tea is meditation. So I... I really love encouraging people that it really is that present state of mind that you're committed to that matters the most. So whether you're sitting or standing or doing it in the morning or doing it in the evening, ultimately, it's really all up to you. It's your personal relationship to meditation that matters the most that works the best for you. Absolutely. Well, Yumi, on that note, we're going to take a quick break. But when we come back, I want to dive deeper into how people can put some of your exercises into practice. We'll be right back. This episode of The Witch Wave is brought to you by Tarot for the Wild Soul, an eight-week online tarot course taught by intuitive tarot reader and teacher and prior Witch Wave podcast guest, Lindsay Mack. This award-winning course is a deep immersion into card theory, tarot spreads, and intuitive expansion presented and taught through a soul-centered lens. Tarot for the Wild Soul is designed to support, enliven, and enrich your tarot experience, infusing you with an advanced knowledge of the deck, a deeper understanding of the cards, and a greater confidence in your skills as a reader. Tarot for the Wild Soul runs from March 21st to May 9th of this year. To sign up for the class or learn more, visit tarotforthewildsoul.com and be sure to use code WITCH for 10% off your tuition. Trust me, you don't want to miss this opportunity to learn from the incredible Lindsay Mack. So go on ahead to tarotforthewildsoul.com and use code WITCH for 10% off your tuition. Welcome back to The Witch Wave. Today I'm speaking with Yumi Sakugawa. So Yumi, we were talking about your illustrated guide to becoming one with the universe and there is no right way to meditate. And in these books, you give these really beautiful exercises. I thought I would go over a couple of them. You have one in your illustrated guide where you have these beautiful drawings showing someone inhaling. And as they're inhaling, 
they're inhaling pain and anger and sadness and insecurity, all the quote unquote dark stuff, right? And then they're exhaling their intentions and positivity. And I've seen different versions of this meditation before. And I remember when I first encountered it before reading your book even, I kind of bristled at the idea, like, why would I take my darkness into my body? Like, why would I Mm -hmm. do Mm -hmm. that to myself? And then I, I remember that expression of turning your poison into medicine and this idea of taking the things that hurt you and kind of transmuting it in your body or your psyche into something more positive. Were you thinking those kinds of things with that exercise? Oh, yeah, definitely. And I believe that breathing exercise, it must have been inspired by a variation of, I want to say it's called the Tonglen meditation, where the idea is that you're breathing in over the duration of the meditation, you start with breathing in your own pain and then breathing that out as healing white light. And then you imagine doing that for somebody, you know, and then you imagine doing that for somebody you don't know. And then you imagine doing that for somebody you don't get along with or have an issue with. And then that eventually expands to your city, the country you live in and the whole world. And so I think I wanted to just take a small snippet of that the idea that not only can you breathe in your own pain to really acknowledge it and give it space and then transmute it into something beautiful, but also that you can be doing that for other people too. I love that. And it feels very alchemical to me, you know, that idea. Definitely. Yeah. Transmuting base matter into gold and using your body and your breath to do that is just really, really moving. On that note, I'd love to have you read a little bit from your book, if you don't mind. So I will be reading from lesson two in your illustrated guide to becoming one with the universe. Uh, This chapter is called Pay attention and listen. Lesson two, pay attention and listen. Emptiness is everything. The universe is always trying to tell you something. Like clues to who you are as a human being, why you are here, your true purpose in life, your secret wish, what makes you happy, what crazy leap of faith you should take right now, what dreams you should follow, how you can truly feel at peace. However, many of us are unable to receive these important messages. We are too busy listening to our regrets, grudges, anger, annoyances, to-do lists, bad memories, worst-case scenarios, worries, unfulfilled desires, anxieties, fantasies about the future, insecurities, sadness, judgments, self-doubts, blah, blah, blah. How can we possibly feel oneness with the universe if we aren't creating any inner space to really listen to what the universe is trying to tell us? Most of the time, the universe speaks to us very quietly, in pockets of silence, in coincidences, in nature, in forgotten memories, in the shape of clouds, in moments of solitude, in small tugs at our hearts. When we completely calm the murky waves of our mind to truly pay attention and listen, we can clearly see what is reflected above and what lies beneath the surface. So for the next few days and for the rest of your life, pay attention and listen. Thank you so much, Yumi. That is so beautiful. And of course, these are accompanied by just incredible illustrations. I really encourage everybody to check out this beautiful book, Your Illustrated Guide to Becoming One with the Universe. And I especially love this idea of having to be quiet in order to see signs and synchronicities. Um, Because I think a lot of people say that they are looking for a sign from the universe and they want the universe to really scream it and shout it and make it obvious, right? Like like they, they need some huge 
kind of explosion in order to wake them up. And uh, be careful what you wish for. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And I think that those things tend to happen kind of as a last resort, like that if people were paying attention and being quieter, they would have probably seen other hints and heard other clues. And the explosion came because they weren't paying attention to the quieter stuff, you know? That's why we have our Saturn returns and (laughs) other transits. (laughs) Exactly, exactly. Now, you do talk about the fact that when you're meditating – And I think David Lynch mentions this too in Catching the Big Fish, that suddenly there are these synchronicities and coincidences that start happening. And I call this following the trail of cosmic breadcrumbs. You know, Oh my God, I love that. (laughs) That, That's what it feels like. I agree with you completely. Yeah. It's like being a mystic detective to your own life. And you're like, oh, here's a clue. Here's another clue. Here's a sign. But you're saying that by meditating, we're able to be more active receivers of those messages or those breadcrumbs. Is that right? Absolutely. I think meditation is not only are you receiving signals, I think you're also making your own signal clear. Mm. If you're clearing the murkiness of what's going on inside, not only are you able to receive information more clearly, I think that soul signal that is already buried within you that you're already born with, I think that is also transmitted louder too, because you're just being more present. Then you become this co-creator with the universe and everything in the world. You're not just sort of being tossed around randomly in the ocean of life. Not only are you able to follow the breadcrumbs, I think you're also then going to find the inspiration to exercise your agency and freedom to do the things that you want to do, not the things that you think you should be doing. Mm, I love that. And it really is this interesting tension, I think, between go with the flow and manifest your dreams. It's this double kind of meaning of life. And I think the trick is probably coming up with a balance between the two. Like, yes, know that change is going to happen. And look, shit's going to happen. It can be hard or surprising or uh, sometimes in really good ways too. And we have to learn to go with the flow and pay attention. But on the other hand, we also, to your point, have agency and I think a responsibility to make our lives meaningful and to manifest as many dreams that come from a place of creativity and compassion and love as we can. And to that end, you have this beautiful line in the book. You say, plant strange seeds and let strange things grow. (laughs) And I, I love that so much. It feels very witchy to me. What do you mean by that exactly, though, for someone who may not have read your book? For me, especially as an artist, and I think with any creative person, you just never know what the outcome of your idea is going to be. So for me, how I like to see the creative process is that you don't have control over the outcome. You don't know whether a work is going to be successful or well-received and even beyond the external validation of it, the actual work, you really don't know, even if you have an inkling of an idea, how it's ultimately going to turn out. But you do have control and agency over starting these ideas. It's not just creativity. I think it's intentions in general. Living is a creative act. And so whether you want to manifest a creative project or you want a new relationship or you just want a new frequency of living, whether it's a new job or a new place or a new way of relating to with the world, I think it starts with intentions. I see the seeds as intentions. It's this tangible thing that you have in your heart and it becomes a seed when you're able to articulate it. I desire a new relationship. I desire a published book. I desire a successful business. And then I think in being able to articulate that desire, feel it in your body, 
and then just sort of surrendering the release of that desire out into the universe that is like planting the seeds and then as you're open and receptive then I think that begins that mystic detective breadcrumb trail work of just seeing how this intention grows I think like a gardener you can't just plant a seed and forget about it you're also making your whole life fertile for this intention desire to grow so you're you're tilling the soil you're making sure there's sunshine coming into the soil you're keeping your ecosystem healthy and vibrant and so I'm just thinking about how if we want a fertile abundant life then we need to be planting those intentions keeping our psychic and physical ecosystem healthy and be energetically as possible coming from this fertile abundant place because when you plant seeds then they become their own entities that then grow other seeds I love that right and then other ecosystems come in and cross pollinate you don't have control over how your book's going to be published or who's going to reach out to you or who's going to give you opportunities. So you always have control over creating a project and putting it out into the world. And just planting that one seed is then going to grow many other things and more things just organically growing. I so appreciate that perspective because in witchcraft, there is this one philosophy that you have to be as specific as possible in order to cast a spell and manifest what you want. And the clearer you are with your vision, you know, and the more exact you are, the more likely it is to manifest or come true. And I think in some cases that's absolutely true. But in my experience, like, I don't often know what's going to be the most incredible thing. (laughs) And, you know, maybe the universe or spirit or whatever word you choose has an even better or more unusual idea than I could ever come up with myself. So I, I love that you're leaving space for... Yes, be specific with your intention, but maybe also leave room for what the outcome is or what shape it might take because it may be different than you picture and even better than you're picturing. Absolutely. I think all of my best opportunities and adventures, they were never anticipated. They always seem to come out of nowhere and were beyond my imagination. And I'm so glad you say that because I think sometimes I do fall into that rut of wanting to manifest this very specific thing. And I think it's great to sort of straddle between those two mindsets. Yes, it's great to sort of hone in on exactly what you want. And sometimes also it's okay to just want a feeling to feel in your body like yeah this is what I want to feel and I'm open to all experiences that's going to support this feeling I I really love that and I'm right now feeling in my body like this buzzing energy because it makes me so happy to contemplate the idea of what would it be like to cast a spell or plant a seed for joy yeah not necessarily how you're gonna get to the joy but just for joy or for meaning or for more compassion more love more pleasure more beauty all of the things that i think most of us would hope to cultivate more in our lives on that note we're going to take another quick break and we'll be right back there's an online shop i love called magic with a k they focus on protection and self-care with everyday magic and their products support one's own innate abilities. Magic with a K offers one-of-a-kind spell kits and starter ritual sets, as well as t-shirts and home items that reflect your love of magic. And soon, they'll be offering tarot-themed ritual bath items, which sound incredible! I have been lucky enough to get to try some of their deluxe incense and resins and can personally attest to the high quality and care that Magic with a K brings to their products. You can find them on Etsy by searching for Magic with a K, all one word, and obviously the magic part of that search term is spelled M-A-G-I-C-K. Or you can go to www.etsy.com slash shop slash magic with a K. 
And this is exciting. Magic with a K is offering an Etsy coupon for Witchwave listeners. Get 20% off your order of $50 or more using code WITCHWAVE20. That's WITCHWAVE20, all one word. So check out Magic with a K on Etsy or read more about them on their blog, which is at magicwithak.com. Welcome back to the Witch Waves. Today I'm speaking with Yumi Sakugawa. So Yumi, we're talking about all these beautiful feelings, love and pleasure and joy, but there is a section in your book, and I know you have so many more books than this. We're going to talk about other ones, I promise you. But in your illustrated guide to becoming one with the universe, one of my favorite sections is when you say, have cake and tea with your demons. And you have these great pictures of demon tea parties and eventually a demon dance party. And I love that concept. It's one that I think Pema Children writes about and Tara Brock writes about this idea of making friends with your darkness. And there's this really great parable of the Buddha who encounters this demon Mara. And rather than always fighting Mara whenever Mara shows up to throw like self-doubt and judgment and anger and lust and greed at the Buddha, the Buddha says, I see you, Mara, and then invites Mara to have tea with him and sets this beautiful cushion down for the demon Mara and serves him the finest tea. And eventually Mara like goes away because Mara has felt seen and acknowledged. So I love this idea of not trying to fight your shadow or fight your demons, but sitting down for tea with them. How did you come into this idea of a demonic tea party? <laughs> Similar to you, Pam, I imagine I must have come across some story or imagery from the Buddhist cosmology of having tea with your demons. And also, there is a Rumi poem that I absolutely love to paraphrase, similar to what you said about Buddha having a tea with the demons. Rumi says something along the lines of treating every emotion and feeling like an esteemed house guest who enters your home. And so even if these house guests representing extremely difficult and turbulent emotions, even if they're like throwing furniture and messing up your home, you're still giving them your uh, kindness and attention and letting them stay as long as they need to. And so I think over time, especially as I went through periods of depression. And for most of my life, I also just had really low rock bottom self esteem. It was this very long ongoing journey of really having to love myself, not just the parts that people liked, but also the parts that gave me shame and self hatred and just that really dark charge of self loathing. There's a reason why over and over so many writers, artists, philosophers, witches, they just keep saying the darkness is where the treasure is, right? And mm -hmm. that's, that's sort of the whole hero's journey in a nutshell, the whole underworld journey, the underworld, the darkest, deepest parts of our psyche, that's where the treasure is. And, and David Lynch also, I think, talks about that in his book. It's really in the depths of the ocean. That's where the big fish is. I think the more you sit with the parts of you that are so uncomfortable and give you so much shame, it's a disowned part of you that really wants to be loved. Mm, yes, I think that's absolutely true. And you also talk about how there are lessons and messages and you have a beautiful picture of a demon giving you a gift or a jewel in the book. And I so appreciate that because I, as I think most people do, have my own battles. Mine specifically are around anxiety. I get very overwhelmed and stressed out. And I've been working so hard to fight my anxiety and resist my anxiety. And, you know, it's this very combative relationship. And then you have this double consciousness of then beating yourself up for feeling bad. Right. It's like you're already feeling bad. And then you have to beat myself up for even having the feeling as opposed to 
sitting and having tea with my anxiety demon. So I need to try that. And I really thank you for reminding me of that. It deeply, deeply touched me. So I appreciate that so much, Yumi. I'm so grateful. Thank you for sharing your experience with your anxious feelings. And I also wanted to add... Having tea with your demons, sometimes it's going to show these really fun sides of you, especially the taboo emotions that you don't allow yourself to feel. Like I know for myself, expressing anger is really hard for me. And so having this ongoing tea relationship with my anger that's been able to reveal different parts of my personality. Also, erotic power is something that's still not easy for me. And so that's another demon that I feel like I'm sitting with. And so I also want to remind people that sitting with demons, it's not just hard work. It can also just show these like really fun aspects of your personality that you didn't know you had that got buried under layers of childhood repression and societal repression. Yes. And Yumi, now I'm dying to see an illustration of your erotic demon. So (laughs) maybe that's my next book. (laughs) That would be amazing. And speaking of fun and irreverent, your latest book, Fashion Forecasts, is such a joy. I was just reading it this morning and like laughing my ass off. Yay! Yeah. (laughs) I wanted to talk about this book. You know, this is a book of illustrations and later some photographs of actual fashions that came into being. And I definitely want to hear about that. But it's essentially you kind of having fun with the idea of fashion and coming up with new fashions for the future. And some of them are really funny and, again, kind of taboo. Like you have a drawing of a pubic hair bodysuit. You have a beard wrap dress. You have menstrual fashion. And you also have some really lovely ones. One of the ones I really loved was the idea of putting gold glitter in your wrinkles. I just thought that was so beautiful because obviously it's something that we're taught, especially as women, to feel shame around as we age, to cover up. And you're like, no, you should gild your wrinkles. Absolutely. Yeah. I just thought it was really, really beautiful. So how did the Fashion Forecasts Project come into being? Have you always been interested in fashion or did this come out in a more surprising or organic way? Growing up, I was intimidated by fashion. I felt like fashion was this exclusive club that only cool kids got the invitation for and the rest of us ugly duckling mortals we just sort of had to flail around awkwardly and try to imitate whatever the cool kids were doing and I think over time as I grew more and more into being a more confident person I think fashion then became this really interesting mode of self-expression. And it really wasn't until a couple of years ago that I think I became a lot more intentional about how I wanted to present myself in terms of clothing and appearance. And I want to cite one specific inspiration source in particular. So my favorite astrologer, blogger, Mystic Medusa, she has this really great blog series on her website, mysticmedusa.com, called Style Your Ascendant. The idea being that it's very good for you to appear as your rising astrological sign. And so I think this was around the time when I actually discovered that, oh, uh, it's not just your sun sign. It's also your rising sign, your moon sign, and and a whole bunch of other things Mm -hmm. in your astro chart. And so when I discovered that I was an Aquarius rising, it just suddenly made so many aspects of my personality and interests make sense. And I remember that her particular interpretation of Aquarius rising fashion, Aquarians are so weird that they're very norm core. They like baggy, loose, comfortable clothing. And because they're so weird, they don't really need to signal to the world their individuality. So they sort of fall into the two camps of either being 
very monochrome and very functional in their clothing or the other extreme is that they're like David Bowie, who's an Aquarius rising where you become this iconic fashion figure. And so I think that just sort of became this interesting starting point for me to play around with fashion and styles that I wasn't really giving myself permission to do. And the fashion forecast drawings, honestly, it started as a really just a doodle that I did on a piece of paper. It's the first page in the book. It's my first fashion forecast drawing where I think I drew somebody wearing plants and I called it Ikebana realness. And <laughs> that just made like me really... laugh so hard. Oh, awesome. And so I, I think I just sort of wanted to poke fun at how serious fashion takes themselves while also appreciating the fact that fashion can be so weird and wonderful. And so I posted that. I didn't think much of it. And I did a few more. And it just seemed to really get a reaction out of people, especially Facebook friends. And I think being the validation junkie that I am, I'm like, oh, great. Well, I'm going to keep doing this. <laughs> and so it just sort of kept going with creating silly kind of dumb fashion and just sort of poking fun at the arbitrary beauty standards we have like our obsession with not showing our nipples or not having body hair and then it all sort of um, out of nowhere a curator from the smithsonian asian pacific american center reached out to me and was like oh we are curating this group art show on intersectionality in Washington, D.C. We want to invite you as an artist. Do you have any ideas for what your art installation can be? And so that was when I was had probably done a couple of fashion forecast drawings at this point. So I, I think I basically made my really silly fashion forecast drawings sound a lot smarter than it initially was where I was like, well, I'm making these fashion drawings and it could be this interesting launching point to explore Asian American culture, ancestral worship, gender dynamics, environmentalism, and so on and so on. And before I knew it, it just, it just sort of became this whole thing and an art book an installation, I commissioned a costume designer friend to uh, create the outfits. And then it became the book that uh, you have right now. So that's a great example of planting a seed, which I'm so thankful for. Oh, and it's so wonderful. I'm so happy you planted that seed. And it's interesting because I know that you're being a little self-deprecating and calling it dumb and silly. And to your point, it's definitely whimsical and funny, but I actually think it's pretty fucking radical. Like a lot of your drawings are really like dismantling taboo and making fun of it. And I often use the phrase reverent irreverence. And, and that's the feeling I get from this book. Like you have this reverence for community and for the body and for feminism and fashion and Asian culture, but you're also kind of poking fun at the fashion industry and weird societal hangups. So I just think it is such a gift. I love this project. Oh, thank you so much, Pam. My pleasure. Now, speaking of pleasure, I know that you <laughs> want to manifest more pleasure and sex and joy. So final question before we have to wrap <laughs> up. How are you planning on doing that? Well, I'm in the midst of figuring that out. But to draw from uh, the things I've been talking about and preaching about through my art practice and the books I've published, I think it starts with planting the seed to be able to articulate, hey, universe, uh, 2018 was fucking rough. <laughs> 2019, I want it to be the springtime, the sexy springtime following this long and hard winter time. I want pleasure. I want sex. I want love. And so I think first it's it's setting that intention, being able to express that. And then I think it's creating space in your life for it. Because when you want a change in your life, 
there's an old way that has to die in order for the new way to come in. And so I think it's just exercising that neural part of your brain that wants to receive more pleasure and love than sex. Tapping into your body and asking yourself, well, what does that feel like? What can that look like? And then I think because you're in that receptive state, you then just become this magnet for interesting new experiences to come into your life because you're open. So I'm on dating apps and I only just started doing so. It's not like I've had any dates that blown me out of the water, but I think just being in that process, that ongoing active process of making myself available, that's just already creating new signals that I'm transmitting out into the universe. I'm letting friends know that this is my goal and intention for this year. And I have other girlfriends who are like, hell yeah, 2018 was shitty for me too. Let's bring on the sex and pleasure and love. And so then we're able to uh, connect with each other and sort of create this like even stronger morphic field of bringing in more pleasure and love. Also being open to possibilities that may be beyond my imagination that most likely are going to make me uncomfortable because it's going to stretch me. It's already putting me in that juicy magnetic state and only more good things are going to come in. Fuck yes, you (laughs) That's awesome. And as a huge fan of your work, I can't wait to see how that culminates visually for you and what new projects you're going to be illustrating and manifesting for your artistic life too. So we'll definitely be watching. And I am sure that people are going to want to know how they can see your work. How can they read your books? Where is the best place for people to find you? So I'm the most active these days on Instagram at Yumi Sakugawa, no space or dashes. And on my Instagram profile, there is a link that then uh, shows links to where to find my books. I also have an iPhone sticker line that's on the App Store that is about having a cake and tea with your demons. I also sort of taking a break from posting a lot on my feed, but I I have been posting a lot of uh, sketches and drawings on my Instagram stories. And to circle back to what you said, Pam, about how uh, this new mindset of pleasure and abundance is going to manifest itself. I've been drawing a lot of naked women. So yes, so previews of what's to come in my Instagram stories. I love it. I love it. Well, Yumi, I can't wait to see your new projects. I can't wait to read more of your books. Thank you so much for sharing it with us. And may you plant many, many more strange seeds. You too, Pam. Thank you so much. That's it for the show. Thank you again to Yumi Sakugawa for being such an inspiration and for having a virtual tea party with me, you, and all our demons. Do you have questions, feedback, need some witchly advice, or just want to share something magical that happened to you recently? Drop me an email at witchwavepodcast at gmail.com. I'd love to hear from you, and you just might make it on The Witch Wire. The Witch Wave is produced and recorded by me, Pam Grossman. This episode was edited by Rachel Jacobs. Thank you, Rachel, and myself. Our theme music is the song Hand and Eye by Lycanthia. Special thanks go to Matt Freeman, Chiquita Pascal, and Simone Fujita. You can check out information about this and other episodes on our website, witchwavepodcast.com. Please subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts and give us lots of sparkly stars because it makes a really, really, really big difference and helps other people find the show. You can follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at WitchWavePod and check out my witch emoji for iPhone by going to witchemoji.com or downloading it from the App Store. And please consider pre-ordering my book, Waking the Witch, which is out on June 4th of this year. Thank you so much for listening. Witches are the future. I'll catch you next time on The Witch Wave.